I, w- I want to begin, first of all, by praying, and then go to tell and share the story of one individual's encounter with the resurrection. But let's pray first. Lord, we, we thank you for the privilege of gathering here today in the name of Jesus. We, we ask you to help us to hear your voice, to respond to it, to, to allow you to speak to us, Lord, in whatever way you desire. Thank you for your word. Thank you for this special day that we celebrate together in Jesus' name. Amen. In the Gospel of Mark, I'm just going to read one verse. Mark 16, verse 9. Now, when he rose early on the first day of the week, he appeared first to Mary Magdalene, out of whom he had cast seven demons. So Easter begins in a burial site at a graveyard at a tomb, and it's early in the morning. Some passages say while it was still dark. It's like the story of a man who who woke up early one morning and went into his backyard to feed his cat. It was just sunrise, and he heard a little boy, Tim, next door, digging in his yard. So he looked over the fence to see what was going on, and, and Tim had a little goldfish pond, a little like koi pond, and, and so the neighbor said, Tim, what you doing? He said, well, I, very tearfully and very visibly upset, he, he said, without even looking up, my goldfish died and, and, I'm, and I'm burying them. Oh, oh, I'm sorry, the neighbor said, but that's a big hole for, for goldfish. Tim patted down the last clump of dirt on the hole, and uh, then he he said, well, the hole is so big because the goldfish are inside your stupid cat. (laughs) Some things start at a grave. In, in, In the Gospel of Mark here, Mary Magdalene, or Mary of Magdala, comes early to the tomb. It's still dark. She, she's there at the crack of dawn. And I want you to listen to her story from the Gospel of John. We'll, we'll we read starting with verse 1, chapter 20. Now on the first day of the week, Mary Magdalene went to the tomb early while it's still dark. Saw the stone had been taken away. She ran came to Simon Peter, the other disciple whom Jesus loved, and said, they've taken away the Lord out of the tomb. And we don't know where they've laid him. Peter went out, and the other disciple were going to the tomb, so they ran, and the other disciple outran Peter. They got, he got there first, and stooping down, looking in, he saw the claws there, but he didn't go in. Simon Peter followed and went into the tomb and saw the claws lying there and a handkerchief that had been around his head, not lying with the claws, but folded together in a place by itself. Then the other disciple who came to the tomb first went in also, and he saw and believed. For as yet they did not know the scriptures that he must rise again from the dead. And then they went away to their own homes. But Mary stood outside the tomb, weeping. And as she wept, she stooped down and looked into the tomb. And she saw two angels in white, sitting one at the head, the other at the feet where the body had lain. And they said to her, Woman, why are you weeping? Have any of you men ever said that to a woman? No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> woman, why are you weeping? She said to them, because he's taken away my Lord, and I don't know where they've laid him. When she had said this, she turned around and saw Jesus standing there, and she didn't know it was Jesus. And Jesus said, woman, why are you weeping? Who are you seeking? And she thought he was the gardener. And she said, sir, if you've carried him away, let me know where you've laid him. I'll take him. And then Jesus said to her, Mary, and she turned 
and said to him, Rabboni, which is to say teacher. And Jesus said to her, do not cling to me. I'm not ascended to my father, but go to my brethren. Say to them, I've ascended to my father, your father, and to my God and your God. And Mary Magdalene came and told the disciples that she had seen the Lord and that he had spoken these things to her. So Mary, early in the morning, desperate, seeking, weeping, sobbing. She's there at the tomb. And Mary, maybe you don't know this, she's a very central figure in the New Testament. She's mentioned 14 times, this Mary of Magdala. Eight times she's grouped with other women when she's mentioned, but her name always is first. It's a kind of predominant way of giving her a sense of notoriety. One time, she's actually mentioned with Mary, the mother of Jesus, and Elizabeth. Five times, Mary of Magdala is mentioned all alone. And, and, the, and the word Magdala, it's an interesting word. It's a city on the northwest corner of the Sea of Galilee, right, right there on the shoreline. Last time we took a group to Israel, we, we, we actually visited Magdala, and they have through archaeology, dug up an old synagogue, and there's actually a table there where the reader would, would stand and read, and there's a beautiful church. It sits right there on the Sea of Galilee in Magdala. And the word Magdala actually means fortress or tower. So some believe there perhaps was a, a large tower there or a fortress, and, and maybe even a place where some ancient people worshiped false gods. The Talmud writings of the Jewish history tell us Magdala was a place of ill repute. Magdala was a place of harlotry, of brothels. And we don't know if Mary of Magdala was a prostitute or a harlot. The Bible never mentions that. We, we do know she loved and followed Jesus. And we do know also that at one time, as we read, she had been filled or possessed with seven demonic spirits. Seven. I, I can't imagine having seven demons. I mean, I have enough, I don't know about you, but I have enough problems with, with me. Right? Can you imagine? I mean, my flesh, my, my sinful nature, my heart. And, and I don't so much blame it on social media or, or television or computers or the culture. It's just this traitor who lives inside of me. That's who I have the most problem with. The everyday temptations and decisions. I hear voices. They're not demonic voices. They're my voice. Buy those Pringles. <laughs> no, I don't want to. Eat that Snicker bar. It's for the kids. Who cares? It's for the kids. <laughs> Sleep in. You don't have to get up. Why should you care about that? Throw your trash over the fence. That guy throws his over yours. <laughs> on and on that voice goes. And we all deal with temptation. So someone described temptation like this and, and the path that we try to walk sometimes. He, he describes it in five ways. Listen how it starts. I walk down the street, and in the sidewalk, there's a, there's a deep hole. I, I fall in that hole. I'm lost. I'm helpless. But it's not my fault. And it, it takes forever for me to find my way out. Number two, I walk down the same street, same sidewalk. There's a deep hole. I, I pretend I don't see it. I, I fall in again. I, I can't believe I'm back in the same place. It's not my fault. It, it takes a long time for me to get out. Number three, I walk down the same street. Now, now stay with me. There's a deep hole in the sidewalk. I see it there. I still fall in. It's now a habit. My eyes are wide open. I know where I am. It's my fault. I get out immediately. Number four, I, I walk down the street. There's a deep hole in the sidewalk. I, this time, I, I walk around it. 
Number five, I finally walked down a different street. There, there's temptation, there's addiction, there's, there's a wrong road to take, isn't there? And we all struggle with that. Jesus said, follow me. I'm the way, the truth, and the life. He, he said, my word will be a lamp unto your feet, a light unto your path. I'll give you life. You, you might be here today and, and are in that hole, in that, in that pattern of, of falling in and falling in. You know what you're doing. And you need a whole new road to walk on. I want you to know this, that at the end of the service, I want to offer you an opportunity if you're here and you don't know Christ or you've fallen away to come back to him. And I want you to be thinking about what you're going to do. But back to Mary of Magdala. What was it like for her to be possessed by seven demons? Did it, did it start as a teenager? Was there some dark cultic thing that went on in her family? Was there some abuse that she experienced or evil pagan practice, witchcraft, sorcery? How did it, and where did it start? Well, there, there were false gods, and we know that Magdala was a place of great sexual prostitutes. But before she met Jesus, I'm sure she must have known she was possessed and driven. Imagine waking up Every day, knowing the darkness and the reality of being under the control of evil spirits. I mean, I can remember having bad dreams when something terrible happened in the dream. You know, like you're being chased at night. Are you run over someone by accident? Are you run over someone on purpose in your dream? Maybe you have those kind of people. Or are the police is chasing you or some monster is after you and you're, you're trying to get away and you wake up and you go, oh, gosh, it was just a dream. Thank God. But imagine waking up every day and it's not a dream. It's a nightmare. And sometimes when bad things happen to you or to people, you know, cancer is the, 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 the word or, or a divorce or an accident or a death of a loved one. And you're going through that process and, and you, you think to yourself, this has is, this is got to be a dream. I just want to wake up. Well, Mary of Magdala woke up every day, not in a dream, but tortured and depressed and in darkness. No, no record of a husband. No, no record of a family life. Don't know if it started as a teen, if she was never, ever had the hope of marriage. Uh, pro probably talked about all the time, stared at. Never allowed in synagogue. No social life. She's an outcast. She's hidden away. She's empty. Mary of Magdala. She, she's like, lives in a tower, like in a fortress. Locked behind the walls of this evil, dark prison. Fearful. So hurt. So different than others. The walls are, are, are very high. No one can come close. And she probably doesn't want them to. No one dared to come close. There's a lot of people like that without demons. Kind of locked in their own world. They may have friends and family, but, but, but they're kind of like in their own Magdala. Lonely. Lots of people around, insignificant feelings inside, afraid, shy. Not who God created you to be. See, I, I was a lot like that at the age of 18. I didn't know God. I, I had dropped out of high school at 16. I was traveling with my brother who was a surfer. And, and I had no idea that God had a plan for my life. That Jesus could forgive me, that he could take away my shame, my guilt, my, all my insecurity inside. I didn't know the Bible. I had certainly had no idea what giving my life to Jesus was all about. I didn't know the Bible said if anyone be in Christ, he can be a new creature. Old things can pass away and all things can become new. They did for Mary. I thought church... I really did. I thought church, the Bible, and Christians were a bunch of weirdos. Why do they go hang out in that building? 
To me, they were, they were nerds with all their rules, their do's and don'ts, and they carried around this little leather book all the time. I never realized that Christianity was about freedom. I never understood that it was about forgiveness and, and healing and starting over and having purpose in life. But, but that's what happened to Mary of Magdala. One day Jesus came to her, he spoke her name, and she responded. And, and, and she came out of her darkness, delivered from her demonic powers. He, he gave her a, a new life. And I want you to listen. That's what Jesus does. He can do that for you. He did it for me. He did it for Mary. And once again, at the end of the service, I want you to be thinking. I want to give you an opportunity to respond. See, see that's the story of Easter. That's why Mary is at the tomb early in the morning. Jesus had given her a new life. Jesus is not religion. Jesus isn't church services. He, he's not a list of do's and don'ts. Jesus says, come to me and I will give you a new start, a purpose. As believers, we, we can forget sometimes what it was like before we came to Christ. Or we can take for granted all the things he's done for us and in us. Our world is so crazy and broken right now. I mean, we're all kind of trying to traffic through the anger and the abuse and the drugs and the divorces and the alcohol and the tension and the shootings and the stabbings and, and, and all the, the issues that are going on and the darkness and the brokenness of our culture today. Well, Mary had been far worse. And Jesus had given her a brand new start. What an amazing thing. And she loved him. It was no big deal for her to get up super early while it's dark to come to the grave. She's the first one there. And the stone is rolled away. And she's like, what? And she runs and she tells Peter and John and, and they come and they assess the situation and then they leave and Mary's all alone again, standing there. Weeping, crying, broken. Jesus had done some amazing things in her life and, and here's the deal. Mary didn't know this yet, but things could not have been any better in her life than they were that morning. She's sobbing, she's weeping, she doesn't seem afraid at all. She's in a graveyard in the dark. I don't mind cemeteries during the day. But I don't go cruising around graveyards at night. Do you? You don't raise your hand. <laughs> Here's this woman in the dark, alone, not afraid, not scared. But she does have a broken heart. I mean, she sees angels and they speak to her. It doesn't even phase her, it doesn't seem like. The Roman guards, when they saw the angels, they fainted like dead men. Not Mary. Listen to what she says. The angel said to her, woman, why are you weeping? Because they have taken away my Lord. Not the Lord or a Lord, not the master. She says, they've taken away my Lord. She's looking for her Lord. I'll carry the body. Just tell me where it is. She, her, her love knows no labor. It's no sacrifice for her. She's not there looking for a, a blessing or a kingdom. She's not there to say, Lord, what are you going to do about the Romans or the government or the power or the, you know, I need another miracle. No, she's there because she loves Jesus. He set her free. The, the motive for, for Mary is just because she loves him and she's the first one at the door and she's grieving. She knows what she has lost. Mary saw the beauty and the love and the compassion and the care that Jesus had given her. And finally, Jesus reveals himself, but she's not sure who he is. When she had said this to the angel, she, she turned around and there he was. And she didn't know it was Jesus. 
Jesus said, woman, why are you weeping and who are you seeking? And, and she's supposing him to be the gardener. I mean, why, why, why couldn't she wreck? I don't know why. Was Jesus like in a flannel shirt with some suspenders, straw hat, and a pitchfork? I, I don't think so. And Jesus says her name, Mary. And suddenly she realizes, Rabboni, master, she says, not healer, not deliverer, but teacher. And he had taught her so much. She had watched, she observed, she listened to his words. It's the last time he's ever called teacher in the Bible. And I think it's because he wants to know he's more than a teacher. He's more than a healer. Now he's a risen savior. Mary, I want you to know me in a whole different way. See, something happened when, when he spoke to her. It was a whole new day. It was a whole new thing. And, and, and I remember when, when I would go to church as a kid, we, we didn't go to church a lot. My parents didn't take us to church except on Christmas and Easter. And they would drop us off at vacation Bible schools just to get rid of us, I'm sure. Just like some of you moms and dads. <laughs> And we would sing songs. I never knew what the songs meant, but I remember as a little kid singing this one song, Father Abraham had many sons, many sons had Father Abraham. And I thought, who is this Abraham guy? <laughs> and, and, and then, you know, they, they would talk about the B-I-B-L-E, that's the book for me. And we would sing that, and I thought, not really, it's not the book for me, I don't read it. I don't even have one. Had no idea who Jesus really was. That, that, that light never came on. I knew about Easter. It was Jesus, chocolate, and jelly beans. But I really didn't know him as Savior. There is a time, I think, when we hear his voice calling us, reaching out to us. The resurrected Christ can, like for Mary, become a reality. Maybe that day could be today for you. She's not there talking about ministry or church or her needs. She just wants to see Jesus again. Because Jesus loved her. Jesus changed her. Jesus freed her. And that's what he does. He, he takes us from our towers. He takes us from our fortresses, from our, from our magdala, so to speak, our hiding places, our hurts, our darkness. And he loves to set us free, to call us by name. And today, if you're here and, and still without Christ in your life, the, the resurrected Christ would say to you, hey, I, I stand at the door and I knock. If you open, I'll come in. Are you calling you on a cell phone, maybe. <laughs> he, he, he died for your sins. He says, come unto me, all you who labor and are heavy laden, and I'll give you rest. I stand at the door, he says, and knock. He won't push his way in, but he asks you to open that door. See, today is not about everyone else. It's about you and Jesus. Mary came all by herself. And that's how we come. Just all by herself. Doesn't matter what this person thinks or that person thinks. It matters what I need to do with Jesus Christ. In just a moment, I want to ask you to make a choice about Jesus. Maybe you're here today and you feel lonely or, 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 or empty or guilty or fearful and you don't have a real relationship with him, I, I can't think of a better day than Easter Sunday to make a step towards him, to open your heart to him.